Speaking about summer camp, this is a good time to mention something. Benny, won't you join me up on stage? <laughs> won't you give it up for Benny? Hey. All right, so Benny, Benny has, and this is, this is a, a, our way of making an announcement. We always try and be as transparent in this church as we can. We like to do that because we are a family. We see ourselves as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we want to be transparent and open with you. And about a year ago now, probably the beginning of this year, Benny started to feel a niggle. I don't know how else to put it. A niggle, a inkling, a feeling, a sense, a who knows what. He started to feel that his time at Crawford would at the end of this year come to an end, at least for a season. So we don't know how long that might be, but we know that at the end of this year, and he's been sensing that, and we've been having dialogue about it for months and months and months, literally, and uh, trying to discern, is this a God thing? I've taken it even to the eldership, and, and everyone has felt the same. This is a God thing, but we don't know where to from here for Benny. So how does this work? Anyway, so we know that this is the next step for Benny. He has served faithfully as our youth pastor for many, many years. This isn't a farewell speech, don't worry. But he served faithfully in youth. He's served in leading worship. He does all of our church news and production stuff. He helps with events. He's, he's actually a lot more involved than you would realize from what you see of him. Um, and uh, him leaving is not like, oh, shucks, man, wish you well, buddy. Um, it leaves huge gaps in the staff team and in the ministry team, and it, it's, he's got big shoes to fill in many, many ways. Um, but if it's a God thing, it's a right thing, right? And we have discerned that this is God. We've got to be obedient. He's got to be obedient. You can imagine how he's feeling, going, well, where to from here? Um, God must open the doors. If this is a God thing, he must open the doors. And um, actually this coming week, Benny is uh, spending two and a half weeks with one of our churches in this region as well. And he's gonna go see if that's the door that God's opening. Sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you're like the apostles in Acts where it's like, I think the Lord said I should go here. Nope, I think I should go here. The spirit of the Lord led us here. Sometimes you're not 100% sure of where, but as long as you're moving, God can steer a moving ship. And so... Benny is going, and, and this week he's going away for two and a half weeks to spend time uh, with another church, so we're excited. I want to encourage you to pray for him, with him, and then some of you are thinking, well, then what, <clears throat> what about the, uh, the youth ministry, and uh, what about that? Well, Sherry, won't you come up quickly? <laughs> So Sherry wears loads of hats in this church as well. She leads Lesotho. She, she deals with our petty cash. She helps with events. Uh, she obviously runs Kids Church. She's been doing that for seven years in this church. Um, she, she has a lot of responsibility and weight, and we thought now's a great time to give her more. And so Sherry, from the beginning of next year, will be leading both youth and children's ministry. <laughs> which she's so ready for, so ready, so excited. So she really is excited, and we believe it's the next way that God is stretching her in terms of other gifting and in terms of other calling that she's got in her life and preaching and organizing in different ways. So we are excited. So the transition has already begun between Benny and Sherry, and they are transitioning, and they will be co-leading camp together. And uh, thereafter, Sherry will be leading the youth as well. Some of you might be thinking, sure, isn't that a lot for one person to carry? The answer is yes. So, Veve, won't you come up? <laughs> <laughs> so, Veve has been doing a uh, year of your life with us. She's been doing EFL uh, with Christy. And we have recognized gifting and calling in her. She is studying theology next year. And also, she will be working... So she'll be studying full-time, working part-time, and she will be the children's pastor's assistant. She will be Sherry's right-hand woman, okay? And so they will, because she is gonna need extra help, Sherry, for sure. What we are grateful for is the volunteer teams in Youth and Kids and Ignite. They carry things in the most incredible ways. If you serve in those ministries, well done and thank you because you carry a lot and you do an incredible amount for this church. And so... Um, we're excited to see what new leadership does, where it goes, what's happening. I want to encourage you, pray for these three people. These are big steps that all three of them are moving into in January 24. Amen. Amen. Let's give them a round. Thank you. Well done. You ready for the message? Anyone? This side of the church is a bit quiet. You guys also ready? 
Okay, that's, that's good. Okay, we're going to get into it. And there are some sermon series that I love doing, and I do them like once a year. I do, I do the same sort of series with different bits and pieces. I love speaking about the parables of Jesus. There's quite a lot of them, so it can take you a long time to get through them. But I like to cover two or three of them every single year. What is Jesus saying through his parables to them and to us right now? Another sermon series I love doing is I love going into books of the Bible. And so two, sometimes three times a year, I'll pick a book and we'll just go a little bit deeper into that book for a couple of weeks, which is also, I find it extremely helpful and I hope as well. There's another series that has become sort of part of the, the rhythms of Freedom Church, and that is the Elephant in the Room series. You remember it. So the elephant in the room is obvious, its name is obvious, it's, it's the big topics that are around and about, that are on people's minds, but no one's really talking about it. And certainly a lot of these topics aren't covered in churches because they could tend to be controversial, there's not a clear answer, uh, is, it, is it gonna edify, is it gonna help the body, or is it just gonna bring more confusion and division? And so most ministers, including myself, will generally stay away from controversial topics. It's nice to be that preacher on YouTube that's very hardline about everything, um, and people love watching those videos of the pastor who's absolutely against this and absolutely against that. I'm not that guy, okay? I think that the world is a lot of shades of gray. I think that sin is sin, and there is black and white, but there's a whole lot of gray in between that, and sometimes we need a little bit of tolerance. We need a little bit of education uh, to be able to figure our way through all the gray that life has. Amen. So, elephant in the room. Last year, we looked at a bunch of topics. We looked at uh, pornography. Well, we didn't look at pornography. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we spoke about <laughs> pornography. We spoke into tattoos and should Christians do that? What about yoga? Is that okay as a Christian? We spoke about gambling. We spoke about mental health. Uh, we spoke, why do bad things happen to good people? We spoke into smoking weed. Is that okay as a Christian? Is that a problem? And so that was all last year's topics, things that we don't really like to talk about in church. This year, there's a couple extra. What I like about this kind of series is it's an invitational tool. So this, you don't even know what's going to be said. Let's be honest. You know what's going to be said at Easter and Christmas. But in this topic, you don't know what's going to be said. I want to encourage you, invite someone, a friend, a family member, a colleague, and just say, hey, we're dealing with a series of quite difficult stuff. If you want to come in here, come in here. I really want to encourage you, use it as an invitational tool. It's just something different. And even if it just starts a dialogue, that's okay. If it just opens the door for discussion in terms of what the Word of God actually says, that's good. That's a win. And so encourage someone to come along even next week, someone who might be unsaved or, or wrestling with some of these things. So this time in the series, we're going to tackle three or four more things. I've got four weeks, and so we're looking at four topics for the next few weeks. But Whenever I do a sermon series like this, particularly this one, I need to give some disclaimers. I've got to mention some things that we've just all got to manage our expectations. We've all got to get on the same page in terms of this kind of series because if it brings division, that's a problem. Um, if it brings confusion, that's a problem. If it brings unclarity, that's a problem. And so I want us to get on the same page in terms of some of these things. And I'm not going to mention these particular things every week, but because you happen to be here for week one, you get the foundational stuff, which I think is going to be helpful. So something I have to say about the series as we get started. Number one, we cannot say all there is to say on a subject. It's just not possible. If you think we can, then you didn't hear what I had to say about smoking weed. We just can't cover everything there is to cover on a subject. Most of the subjects we'll cover have been topics that have been raging on between Christians for not just decades, sometimes hundreds of years. Books have been written about these subjects. I've got 20 minutes. There is absolutely no way I can cover all the bases. And so I'll do my best. But in some of these cases, you might want to go and do some follow-up homework. You might want to do some research. You might want to search wiki or watch other messages. Just be careful 
because there's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of rubbish out there. If you come across something and it looks super convincing, but something in you just says, mm mm, feel free to just message your small group leader or someone on staff or, or any of us, and we'll be able to help with that. But we're not going to say everything. So if you need to do some extra work on your own to figure some stuff out, that's great. Do it. Number two, there is room for difference. What we are talking about when we talk about these topics and subjects are not usually salvation issues. In other words, salvation is absolutely crystal clear, right? By faith, through grace. Jesus, he died. He rose again. We believe that. He did that for the forgiveness of our sins that we could know him. No one's debating the salvation issues. But where we are speaking about are some of the gray areas that there's sometimes a little bit of uncertainty, and you may not 100% agree with everything that we're saying. It's okay. Don't leave the church over it. Okay. Don't just go, well, I can't be part of a church that believes this, that, or the next thing. These are not salvation issues. We dialogue in the differences. And that's really, really important. If you've got something and a strong opinion or a reason as to why you think this or that, let's talk about it. Let's talk it through. That's the healthier, more godly way to do it. And so I'd encourage you to do that. There's usually, on any of these topics, strong Christians on both sides of the line. And so it's important that as believers, we are able to hold those differences and still love each other as brothers and sisters. That's hugely important in this. So don't leave the church because we've got different views. What we don't have time for in something like this is intolerance. We don't have time for judgmental and we don't have time for legalism. There's no space for that in this kind of setting, okay? It just doesn't work. Legalism is when you put words in the mouth of God and you say, no, but it should be like this. But does the Bible say it? No. Then, then we're being legalistic. Okay, so don't leave the church because we've got different views. Number three, we must keep our focus on Christ. This is important. We've got to do this. I feel like I'm like preparing for a title fight here, like, and in the left-hand corner, okay, but we've got to do this. We've got to keep our focus on Christ. It's easy to be distracted by controversial subjects, and it's amazing how many Christians find a hobby horse to ride for the rest of their lives, whether it's the book of Revelation or Israel or the end times. Some, they get their be in a bonnet about one topic and it becomes their Christianity for the rest of their lives. That is so unbalanced and so unhealthy, it's not even funny. We need to not do that. Our focus is always Christ. What we do here is not a TED talk. This isn't information. Hey, yeah, now you go. You've got a whole bunch more information than when you came in. No, no, we're always hoping that yes, we equip. Yes, we help guide. Yes, we educate but we hope that whatever gets said here will take you closer to Christ and help you to love people better. That's the bottom line. That's the goal of these messages. Is that okay? Still with me? Okay, everyone got the rules? Are you ready to rumble? Okay. First topic that we're going to cover. That's interesting, hey? <laughs> Some of you are looking at others of you. <laughs> Halloween, what a strange one to pick. Do we even celebrate Halloween in South Africa? Halloween's an American thing, right? We're not like, who cares? What's, what happens in America stays in America, right? But Halloween has got some interesting roots, got some interesting history, and actually it does cause a bit of division amongst Christians. Not just Halloween, Christmas, Easter. There are controversial bits and pieces of all of these things that Christians battle with. And so I've actually picked an easy one for this week. Halloween's easy. Why am I picking it? It's in two days' time. Did you even know that? No. Did you care? Not really. Okay. Halloween's in two days' time, and you're going to start to get little pictures of your nephews and nieces and little cousins and whatever, and they're all dressed up and all that kind of stuff. Don't think that it's not around, okay? Just because it's not in your house, don't think it's not around. Everything that, that happens overseas eventually gets to the cities and eventually gets to the towns. It is the way that it is. The reason is money. 
Obviously, it's a big money spinner. So Halloween is huge for commercial stuff. Do you know how much gets spent on Halloween in 2023, in two days' time? Do you know how much money will be spent in America, just in North America? $12 billion, not rands. <laughs> $12 billion, so it's massive money. $4 billion on decor for Halloween. I mean, that's nuts. You think about the houses and the costumes and all that kind of stuff. It's a massive money spinner. So I promise you, whether you like it or not, it's coming here because people can make money from it. So it's good to know a little bit about it. And hopefully that's what we're going to do. So Halloween is an easy one, but trust me, the next three that are coming are going to be less easy. <laughs> we're going to be speaking about the Christian's response to what's happening in Israel now. We're going to be speaking into LGBTQ+. Plus. We're going to be speaking into evolution and creationism. So those are three big things that are coming. And if you've heard any of those topics, you know. <laughs> it's going to be very hard to cover those in 25 minutes. Uh, but we can hopefully bring some guidance from the Word of God into those situations and bring some clarity. That's the goal. So today I kind of picked an easy one because the date works out really well that it's coming up. So let's see and let's get into it. What's the issue with Halloween? As I say that, I must just, if I can get to speaking into Christmas and Easter a little bit later, I'm going to do that. I just hope that I've got the time for it, okay? All right, so what's the issue with Halloween? Well, as I said, there's Christians on both sides of the fence here. On one side of the fence, you've got Christians who say, I will have nothing to do with Halloween. Nothing. Don't bring it near my house. Don't let a child come and ring my doorbell on the 31st of October. Don't you let me see a costume or anything, any kind of decor in my house. I want nothing to do with Halloween. Why? Well, there's normally two reasons that this side of the fence has. The one is that Halloween seems to celebrate the evil. It seems to celebrate death and gore, and vampires, and goblins, and uh, you know, like horror movies. It seems to celebrate evil stuff. That's the one reason. The other reason is that it's a night of the year when a lot of dark stuff happens. What do I mean by that? You may not have been exposed to this, but if you've done any reading or if you've watched any testimonies of ex-Satanists and people who were involved in the occult, you will know that Halloween is a big night for them. It's not just any night. In fact, and I mean, you don't have to do this, but I've seen the Satanic calendar. It's a big night for them. The 31st of October is, is a deal that they make. So... Um, so those are two reasons that some Christians will say, well, because of that, there's absolutely no ways I want anything to do with Halloween. But then on the other side of the fence, you've got Christians who say, well, I get those things, but my kid wants to wear a Superman costume and go and eat someone's chocolate. <laughs> like, we're not going to worship the devil. Um, we're not going to dress up with bloody, hectic, you know, like crazy stuff. We're not doing that. No one's worshiping anything weird. Costume, candy, decor. Is that evil? Hmm. Well, now all of a sudden, where do you sit? No, seriously, where do you sit? Because <laughs> it's not so clear cut. You can, you can be on either side of that fence. With a subject like this, I always think it's good to get a little bit of history. So is it okay if I give us a little bit of history? I'm not going to go into depth and lots of names and dates or anything like that. But it is helpful to see the roots of something. Sometimes it just gives you a clarity where it came from and, and, and why it was celebrated in the first place. Maybe it's interesting. Maybe you hear something here that you hadn't heard before. So once we look at a bit of the history, we'll look at should Christians celebrate this or not. So the word Halloween, most of you probably know this. It comes from, uh, from a little phrase, All Hallows Eve. Here's the deal. The 1st of November, from a long time ago, which I'll talk about now, was All Saints Day. The 1st of November, and the night before that was All Saints Eve obviously, like Christmas Eve is the night before Christmas. So All Saints Eve, it got abbreviated and changed, and through the language, it's Halloween. Halloween is All Saints Eve, okay? And so that's literally where the name comes from. It doesn't come from any dark, weird space. It's just they would celebrate the saints. It could actually shock you, but uh, Halloween might not be as pagan in its roots 
as you think it could be. It was a time set aside by the church to re remember and celebrate its saints. And so think about this. Once Jesus had died and resurrected, the apostles, who obviously were believers themselves, most of them were martyred, okay? 11 out of 12 killed for their faith. Many, many other people, thousands of people were killed for their faith. We know about Rome and the Colosseum and all those sorts of things. We know about Emperor Nero and the way he used to persecute and torture Christians. So many, many people died for their faith. And so the Christians in those early, early days would take a day of the year just to remember and to honor the people who had died for their faith. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? You don't know if you can say yes or no now. I can tell. There is nothing wrong with that. It's literally just honoring people. It's not doing anything. It's just saying, sure, you know, like, praise God for what they did, what they went through, that they stuck to their, their faith like they did. That was fine. But then about 600 years after that, and anyone who knows their history knows that's about when the time the Roman Catholic Church took a rise. That's the time of the popes, uh, and, and they began to be the religious voice for the world at that stage, was the Roman Catholic Church in Rome, which is where so much of this happened. And so about 600 years after Jesus, Pope Gregory III, who's the third pope, Gregory I was the first pope ever. Um, so he built a special room to store relics of the apostles and of the saints. So he built an enormous place where you could store those things, the martyrs and the saints. We've been to Rome. We've seen some of those relics. Everyone claims they've got the original. That's the weird thing. So, oh, these are the feet where Jesus walked. Look at the mud. They carved it out. But down the road, they got the fake, I promise. Everyone's got the fake. All right. But, but relics in Rome, massively important. And so they would have this room dedicated to all the relics of they drank out of this, they did this. Here's the chair where, you know, and, and they would have all these things. And what they believe is that this room dedicated to the saints was dedicated, was opened up on the 1st of November, and that became the official day that they would celebrate the saints and the martyrs and the people who had died for their faith. I mean, it's starting to get a little weird here, if you ask me, that we've got now rooms and relics and, okay, a special day to remember them. It really just went downhill from here. This is the problem. So... Those few days were usually used when they would honor the saints, as I mentioned to you. But here's what they started to do from then, was that they would also not just honor the saints, not just remember them, but also pray for the souls of people who had died that they could get into heaven. And that was All Saints Day. Is that weird to anyone else? That's not okay. Okay. So immediately, this thing that was like, let's remember those who have fallen became a, let's pray for those who have died and haven't quite made it to heaven yet. That's a theological problem we're sitting with right, that, that is a problem. Because the Bible is absolutely clear. You die, then there's judgment. That's it. There's no middle ground, there's no purgatory, there's no waiting period, there's no space that your soul just floats and if you're lucky, you can work yourself, maybe you just missed it, but you can work yourself into just making it, which is fantastic. No, that doesn't exist. That's not in our Bible. That's not in our beliefs. This is extremely important that we understand this because this view differs massively from our view. But it was the Roman Catholic view, and there was purgatory, and so the celebration kept evolving. So, so now it became about honoring the saints and praying for those that had died that they would get to heaven, but it kept evolving in Christianity, and I'm using inverted commas there, Christianity, where 400 years later, they had a whole bunch of new things they had to do. Now it wasn't just about honoring and praying. Now they felt, you know, we, we need to have bells ringing. Why? Is that in the Bible? No, it doesn't matter. We just want to do it. Okay, well, we're going to have bells ringing for those who are in purgatory. Okay, what else are we going to do? Well, let's have criers. Ooh, ooh, that sounds exciting. What are criers? Well, criers dress in black and they walk the streets and they literally mourn. And what that does is it encourages you on that day to pray for those who have died that they could get into heaven. What? This is now become, this is weird, right? But it's Christian, but it's weird. A couple of hundred years later, it evolved even more. Now you've got groups of poor children 
often, or people, often children, would go door to door collecting soul cakes in exchange for praying for the dead. This was called souling and is thought to be the start of trick-or-treating. So it's n- now these criers, it's not enough for them to remind you to pray for the dead. Now our kids started cottoning on, hang on. If you don't want to pray, I'll pray for you. You just got to give me something nice. <laughs> so I'll go to your house. How's it going? Trick or treat. Here's a cake. Don't worry, I'll pray for the person who, in your house who died who's waiting in the middle place. Weird, eh? But that's where it comes from. So there, there, that's thought to be the start of trick or treating. And while they were souling, as they called it, they're big on the word soul, Christians would carry lanterns made of hollowed out turnips at that stage. Remember, we're talking about Europe, not America. If it was America, it would have been pumpkins. But it's Europe. They had turnips. And they became pumpkins later. Those jack-o'-lanterns were used to ward off evil spirits. Please show me that in the Bible. Like, Are we just making up stuff at this point? So now the guys who are going and getting the soul cakes, who who thinks of a soul cake? Now they've got to carry lanterns to ward off evil spirits. So now there's, there's just tradition on tradition on tradition. A little later, candles became a big deal for Halloween, and they called them, you guessed it, soul lights. They were lit in homes to do what? To guide the souls back to their earthly visit that one night of the year that they could be guided back to their place where they left from. Bizarre. As for the wearing of costumes during Halloween, you might have wondered where that came from. And there's a couple of options to choose from on to where this originated. But one of the strong ones in my research came from uh, a minister named Prince Sori Conte. And he said this, it was traditionally believed that the souls of the departed wandered the earth until All Saints Day and All Hallows Eve provided, oh sorry, and All Hallows Eve provided one last chance for the dead to gain vengeance on their enemies before moving to the next world. This was your last shot. You got until this night, even if you did, to get vengeance. So in order to avoid being recognized by any soul that might be seeking such vengeance, people would wear masks and costumes. Most of this was believed and practiced in what is known as the Dark Ages. I think it's a fantastic phrase. It is the Dark Ages. But when the Reformation happened, so again, if you know your history, you know the the Reformation was around the 1500s. And that's the time when people start to read the Bible for themselves for the first time. And so before that, the the church was ruling the interpretation, the reading. It was the church only who could read the Bible and tell you what it said. So if they said, hey, soul cakes and bells, you were like, yes, sir. But then the Reformation happened and they translated the, the, the New Testament into a language people could read and they started reading it and going, I don't see soul cakes anywhere. I don't see bells anywhere. I don't see candles anywhere. I don't see spirits, vengeful spirits. I don't see any of this stuff in the Bible. So they said, we're done with this. We're not. So, so they began to abolish a lot of the stuff. They still remembered and honored the human beings who had sacrificed or given their lives for their faith, they would still do that, but they try to distance themselves from all the walking around and the costumes and the, all the other stuff. They found that it was unbiblical and doctrinally wrong, which I'm sure sitting here, you can nod your head with. It absolutely is. And so this was all in Europe. Halloween did not start in America. It started in Europe. So how did it get to America? Well, in the 19th century, some 200 years ago, there were a lot of Scottish and Irish immigrants. They left and they made little communities in America and they came with those traditions and those ways of celebrating All Saints Day. And of course, those slowly worked their way into the mainstream of America, into movie culture and pop culture. And of course, they are, they've moved overseas to where we are now, to where Australia is, to everywhere. It's, it's you know, with social media and movies, it's, it's literally everywhere now. But that's the origin story for Halloween. Is that interesting? Does it surprise you Halloween's more Christian than pagan in its roots? You've got to inverted commas there. More Christian than pagan. It's difficult. So 
If it is more Christian in its roots, does it mean it's okay to celebrate it? Since it does have Christian roots. Some people want to go further back than that, though, and say, no, no, even before the church adopted it as All Saints Day, it was celebrated by other people groups. It was celebrated by Celtic people, by the Druids, long before the church adopted it. And that's a flimsy argument. They used to celebrate the 1st of November because it was the end of harvest. It was going into a winter space for them, and they would celebrate it, but it was nothing like what we understand and what we see in terms of Halloween. And so you could say it has pagan roots, but I think that's a bit of a stretch. I think it's much more likely that it actually has Christian roots. It's interesting. So is it okay for us to celebrate it as Christians today? Well, you know that Halloween wasn't around in the time of Christ. It wasn't around Bible time. So there is no verse and chapter I can point to to say yes or no. But there are some biblical principles that guide how we conduct ourselves in general And I think that'd be helpful. So here's a question then. Is there anything evil about a Christian dressing up as a princess or a cowboy or a superhero and going around the block asking for sweets? Is there anything unchristian about that? You may not want to say the answer, but it's important that you do. Is there anything wrong, evil, unchristian or ungodly about dressing up and asking for candy. There's not. There's not. We can impose our thoughts and our feelings and our emotions onto something that's happening. We can do that, but, but if you're asking if it's unchristian, I think you would find it a stretch to say yes. Is there anything evil about that? No. Are there things about Halloween that are anti-Christian and should be avoided? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you or your children are going to participate in Halloween, what I'm encouraging you with today is that you should keep away from the darker aspects of the day. If you know me by now, you know I'm not going to give you a you must or you mustn't. I believe that the Spirit of God speaks to me as much as He speaks to you. And you need to hear God for yourself. If you are convicted about something and you behave outside of that conviction, you're sinning. And so you need to be convinced and convicted and act and behave from that. It's very important. I'm trying to guide you into that space. So there are things that are dark and I'm encouraging you to stay away from any of the darker aspects that sometimes accompany the day. So, I'm going to give you three extremely practical things. And these apply to Halloween night, but they apply to most nights, as you'll see. (laughs) Number one, dress up right. Dress up right. If you or your kids are going to dress up, stay away from things that glorify death and gore and blood and horror Stay away from things that are, what was that word you said? Promiscuous. (laughs) I've got a much harsher word. (laughs) It rhymes with putty. Okay, so, (laughs) so, and that's guys and girls, just if I can be clear. Stay away from stuff like that. Stay away from the stuff that glorifies death and stay away from stuff that is promiscuous. Costumes that cause people to lust and to stumble. This is Halloween, but it's not just Halloween. You're reading between the lines. Show more style, show less skin. There is no need to use it as an excuse. Funny what suits come out on Halloween. Anyone seen a naughty nurse recently? Well, you're going to in two days on social media. Cat suit, huh? Cat woman. Old school. People love the costume. We were, rec- <laughs> we were recently at something where someone had a mummy costume. It wasn't wrapped tightly enough. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. 
People see it as an excuse to do things they would never ordinarily do, dress in ways they wouldn't ordinarily dress. And it's wrong because we are brothers and sisters. We care for each other and we, we're not trying to cause anyone to stumble or lust, right? So we need to be careful about how we dress. Certainly on Halloween, but I think that one is a general principle. Then, have self-control. For loads of older people, this is not really a kid's thing, but for teens and older people, this can be just another excuse to party too hard. So what I'm saying is show restraint. Exercise self-control. Let your life reflect the fact that you have died to yourself and have been raised to new life with Christ. Let your life show that. This is for Halloween, but it's also show restraint. It's important. Have self-control. Then the third one, avoid dabbling. This one is not going to affect most of the people in this room, but it might affect one or two of you. And I can relate to this one because Halloween, just so you know, isn't some new thing. When I was in school, which was well over 20 years ago, we would celebrate Halloween. And I would go out with friends and that sort of thing. And it would be an excuse for them, particularly one or two of them that I can think of, to play games that they wouldn't ordinarily play. To bring out things and to, to, to have certain activities which never came out any other time but at this time. Throughout the Bible, God is crystal clear about the occult. Christ followers and the occult do not mix. They do not mix. There are activities that are completely anti-Christ, but for some reason around Halloween time, there are people, even Christians, who dabble in those things without even realizing that they are opening spiritual doors for Satan to walk through. You know, they talk about God being a gentleman. You've got to invite him in. Well, the enemy's the same. You open a door, he's very happy to walk through it. You keep the door closed, he's not going to burst himself in. Does that make sense? Especially for a believer. But sometimes people open doors that they don't realize they're opening. Ouija boards. Seances. Mediums who speak to the dead. Sangomas. White magic. Witch doctors, Wicca, horror movies. Those things we've got to be careful of. The bottom line you need to hear about these activities is that they're open doors for the enemy to walk through. So th to be even more practical than that, if you have an unhealthy fascination with violence, gore, the devil, or the occult, or if you communicate with those who have died in any way, shape, or form, any way, shape, or form, you've opened a door for demonic bondage in your life. I know this message suddenly took a turn. I can feel that the energy in the room, but this is important. Some people say, well, it's my child who died. I just want to... I just want to hear from them. It's my parent who passed away. It's my uncle. It's my grandfather. I just want to hear what they're saying. I just want to hear them tell me this or that. It doesn't matter what your reason is. The Bible on this particular thing is not gray. It is crystal clear. Believers and the occult do not mix. And it opens doors into demonic bondage in your life. If you've invited them in, you need to repent, ask for God's forgiveness, and renounce those behaviors. I can't be more clear and straight than that. Those things are not healthy. They're not helpful. They will take you backwards. They will wreck your spiritual walk. Are you hearing me? That's it. I just want to share that with you, and I think this is a good opportunity to do it. I get that that doesn't affect everyone in the room, but it is important that you hear it. Okay, let's get back to this. Is it okay for Christians to celebrate Halloween or not? Can we just get to the answer? 
1 Peter 2 verse 16 says this. This is, we, we've got a bunch of verses. When we were choosing the name Freedom Church, there are just brilliant verses in the Bible that speak to freedom. This is actually a couple of them. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 16, live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but live as free people because we are free in Christ. Galatians 5, 13, for you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. What are these saying? You are free. You are not under the law. What does that mean? It means I don't get to tell you, do this or don't do that. I get to tell you what the Word of God says, and then you get to decide. You get to discern. You get to ask the Holy Spirit. Is this something I can or should get involved in, or isn't it? You are free to choose. And in your freedom, you can choose that you and your family will or won't participate in Halloween. I'm not pushing either way. But what I would encourage you to do very strongly is read one chapter of the Bible. Not anyone, I'm gonna give you the chapter. Romans chapter 14. If you're gonna do your own quiet time, your own devotional, this will be a great thing to read, a great chapter to read this week. Romans chapter 14. It's a wonderfully clear teaching on how we are free in Christ, but how we must not use that freedom to condemn other people, to convict other people. In other words, if you are convinced and convicted that Halloween is to be avoided at all costs, that is not something you have to impose on someone else. And if you believe it's okay to celebrate Halloween and it's your mission to convince other people that they're wrong because they're so narrow-minded, it's not your place to do that. It's a wonderful chapter on that. It speaks about the, what you eat. It speaks about what day you celebrate. It speaks about all those things. But here's, here's a couple of verses from it. Romans 14, 12, and 13. It says, yes, each of us, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other and decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. Some believers don't like the fact that we have to think of unbelievers when we live our lives. Like, it's not fair. They can just do what they want, but I have to keep on thinking someone's watching, someone's watching, while well, someone is watching. And can I tell you something? Your life isn't yours. Christ paid for it. It's his. You have died. Dead people don't get offended. Dead people don't get upset. This is an important thing. We live for Christ. Is this Okay. Okay. Good stuff, man. Come on. I find it helpful. So, I don't think Christmas and Easter. Don't know if I've got the time for that. Let's, let's, you know what, let's stand with me with this one. Because I'm going to be quick. And that's going to help me be quick, seeing you getting fidgety. Something interesting about this morning is that Halloween has some Christian roots, but it became an absolute dog show, didn't it? Became an absolute pagan mess where nothing, now, now we don't just honor those who have given their lives for their faith. No, we just, it's just become about all these weird man-made traditions and whatever. Christmas and Easter, what's the problem some people have with that? The, the problem is simply this, that it has been so heavily commercialized. Some people have a problem with the dates. You can't have a problem with the Easter date. That is historically accurate. But some people have a problem with the December 25th date. And it, listen, don't let that trip you up. I don't know how else to say it. If that's been a bugbear of yours for years of your Christianity, get over it now. Because it means nothing. The fact of the matter is the date is not important. The earliest theologians actually do trace it to that date. I'm just going to tell you that now because some people say, no, it couldn't have been. It's winter, northern hemisphere, this, that, and the next thing. The earliest people who were taking records and trying to trace back the birth of Jesus trace his conception to the 25th of March, 
and nine months later is the 25th of December. They actually do take it there and they do try to do that in a legitimate, historical, accurate way. What if it's the 24th of December? Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> Don't hang your, you know, your whatever on that. <laughs> Just, it's not that important. The commercialization of Christmas and Easter, I would agree, is a bit of a mess. But the world is into money. What are you going to do? They're into money. If you can sell a Christmas tree, sell a Christmas tree. If you can sell presents, sell presents. Halloween's not the only... The, people spend much more at Christmas than they do at Halloween. Let me tell you that. Is that okay? Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? What's important is what you remember and what you celebrate at Christmas and Easter. Whether people have little chocolate bunnies that lay little chocolate eggs, don't ask me how that works. I don't know how you get bunnies and eggs in the same place. If you've got that, who cares? <laughs> if your kids get an Easter egg, who cares? If your kids get a present, who cares? If you put up a Christmas tree, who cares? Yeah, but didn't the pagans used to dance around the Christmas tree? Who cares? I promise you, I won't dance around the Christmas tree, okay? I won't worship another god while I'm doing it. Don't worry, don't worry about that. Now it's just stuff. It's man-made stuff. We have to acknowledge that. None of it's God stuff. None of it's like, oh, presents. It must. No, no, no. We can make it spiritual. Jesus is the greatest present. The Easter egg is hollow because of the tomb. Oh, you can make it spiritual, but I promise you it's not really. What is important are the facts. And the fact is Jesus was born. And the fact is he died cruelly and horribly and was raised to life again on the third day to ascend to heaven where he is right now praying for you and me. Those are the facts. The other stuff is fluff. Who cares? Don't be offended if you see a Christmas tree in someone else's house. Are you with me? There we go. That's all. Christmas, Easter, Halloween. All done. One wrap. <laughs> I'm going to pray. Father, we do thank you God, that we have freedom in Christ. That God, we're not bound by laws. We're not, we're not under a huge list of do's and don'ts, constantly worried about if we're making it or if we're not making it. God, our faith and our hope is in you. Thank you that your blood paid the price for my sin, all of it, and that I have been purchased and that I am free Thank you, God, that your Holy Spirit resides in me, speaks to me, convicts me, leads me, and helps me. Thank you, Lord, that you speak to all of us in that way. God, we pray that we would be people who reflect that in the things we celebrate, in the way we celebrate, in the way we live our lives, that we would reflect the new life we have in Christ. I want to give you a chance right now before I close off, and I'm going to end the service now, but if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I haven't exactly been preaching a gospel message, but what I've tried to make extremely clear is that Jesus historically lived, was born, He lived, He preached, He taught, He died, and on the third day, he rose from the dead. That his sacrifice on the cross paid the full cost for your sin and for my sin. And the only thing the Bible says we need to do in order to receive that eternal life, that forgiveness, that freedom, the only thing, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And for some of you, maybe the Halloween thing was interesting but there's some deeper business God wants to do with you today. And if all you've here heard is a very clear message that Jesus loves you and that he died for you and that he made a way for you to be forgiven, that you can accept that in these moments. Right now, you can accept that. Right now, you can put your faith in him. Right now, you can say, come and rescue me, forgive me, make me completely new. And I would love to lead you in a prayer 
exactly like that. It's a prayer of surrender, acknowledging Him as the one who loves you and died for you. If that's you this morning, can I ask that wherever you're standing, just everyone else's eyes are closed. I'm looking around. I'm trying to see, is there anyone here who says that's me? Please pray for me today. I want to know this Jesus. God bless you. I see that hand. Is there anyone else while I'm looking around? I just want to make sure I don't miss anyone. Anyone else? This is your moment. Can, can I ask that we would pray as a family? And let's pray out loud. And, and for you praying this for the first time, let this be something significant. Let it be your heart calling out to the heart of God. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for Jesus who was born and who lived and who died, not for his own sin, but for my sin. Thank you that his blood can wash my sin away and make me completely new. Please do that. Forgive me. Make me a new creation. I want to live for you from today onwards. Help me in Jesus' name. And thank you for the plans you have for my life and for the way that you love me. I worship you and I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen.